I'm super excited to have a really special guest. Um, it is Brandon Brekelman. Brandon, hey Brandon, how you doing? Hey Dad, how's it going? <laughs> good, good. <laughs> Um, so yeah, Brandon is, I'll let you introduce yourself a bit, but you are working in Puerto Rico right now, living there full time and working for us for Kensington Fund. And uh, maybe just share a little bit about your experience, what, what, what you're uh, looking for in real estate. And then we have a project here that we're just going to walk through and um, uh, Brandon and I, sorry, Brandon, we were, we were, I just want to share that we were going through a project here the other day and I thought, well, this would be a great one for us to record. And so that's how we got to this point. So we haven't, haven't discussed it very much at all, but uh, this will give an idea of how we go through and evaluate projects. So uh, you want to just share a few words, Brandon? Sure. So I've been living in Puerto Rico for about three years now, working with Kensington and um, I've done a couple fix and flip projects. Uh, I'm on finishing up the fourth one right now. And um, basically I'm looking to get into something of my own where I can live in hopefully a multi multi-family property where I can live in it as well as rent it out. And uh, the area that I like actually lends itself well to doing Airbnb or vacation rentals. So that's a possibility I'd like to explore. Um, and we, I've, I've found a property fairly close to where I live right now. So I, I know I like the neighborhood. Um, it's, it's a really central spot that's, it's called Miramar in San Juan. Um, centrally located, it gets quite a few tourist visitors. It's sort of outside of the tourist zone, which is nice, but still close enough that People are open to renting it on Airbnb, um, and the the street is really nice. the The neighborhood has a lot of historic buildings, um, so this this is one that I would like to explore and see how far we can get on. Sure, great. Well, maybe uh, I don't know if you have any pictures pulled up on it, but maybe uh, in a little bit, in case you have a couple of pictures, it'd be nice to do a couple of snapshots just to get a visual on it. Sure. But can you just uh, start out by? Uh, well, so I think one of the goals here is to talk about a little bit about the possibility of alternative financing, because uh, your goal is not to necessarily go into the bank and just get all the money that's needed to buy it and then live in it and rent out the rest of the property. It's more, I think you're looking for, uh, you're looking to get in, if I understand correctly, with as little down as possible. And, yep. and you're looking for the additional rent that would come in to help make payments. And so, um, so that's how we got to this point of, of discussing, discussing the project. So would you mind just uh, sharing a bit of details, maybe the, the pricing, the amount of work that you think it might take, uh, just describe the property first. Sure, so this property has, um, the main house has two units. Each unit has two bedrooms. Uh, the upstairs, upstairs unit has two bedrooms, one bath. The downstairs has two bedrooms, two bath, where they converted one of the closets and took advantage of some of the space there to create another bathroom. So that's something that could potentially be done down the road uh, to the second floor uh, if, if, it's, if we determine that that adds value to the mm -hmm. property. Okay. Um, and then it's also got a, a building in the back that's sort of semi-attached that has a very small studio upstairs with a, with a bathroom. It doesn't currently have a kitchen, but a, a very simple kitchen cabinet and small stove could, could, um, could be added. And those, those sorts of rentals are really common here for students and single people who don't need much space. And then downstairs, there's another studio. Um, that one, I, I don't even like to call it a studio because it's so small that I, I don't, don't see how anybody could really comfortably live in it, mm -hmm. but it's got a garage space next to it that could easily be converted to add space to it, to add a bedroom basically. Okay. And it would be about the same size as the upstairs. So, so basically it's four units total. Mm -hmm. um, the building and, itself, go ahead. Uh, so four units and, and with some work that would be required to get them to get four rentable units at this point. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I would say minimal work to get to get the the two smaller units 
rentable, but yeah. And what do you have a, a, any rough idea on the cost that it would take to do that? Rough idea, I would say maybe $2,000 for the downstairs unit. And the upstairs unit is basically just putting in a $500 cabinet and getting a stove, which, you know, maybe be $300. Okay. So maybe any outside work that really needs to be done? Um, not, not a whole lot. Nothing urgent that would need to be done right away. Okay. Uh, there's a little bit of painting that could be done on the exterior in the, in the courtyard area. There's sort of an interior courtyard where it looks like they might have removed some, some tubing or downspouts or something. Okay. Um, that could be painted. The roof needs another coat of sealer. There's one small spot on one of the balconies that shows a little bit of leakage in the roof, but I don't, it's, it's not something that would need to be done before the purchase um, okay. or before and, things are cash flowing necessarily. Okay. And so should we just use maybe 3000 as a rough number? Or what, what do you think would be a, a, a number that covers it so that you can get the, the ideal amount of rent that you would get from those four units? Well, the, there's the upstairs main unit, which also does not have any kitchen cabinets. And uh, probably, I think you could do a kitchen in there for 3500 to 4000 Okay. Um, that one, an idea I had to, to squeeze by to get it going, you know, to, until things get going is get an, get another one of those $500 cabinets just to live in live with for a little while, little while. I have no problem living with that in the upstairs unit. Well, mm -hmm. while we get the downstairs one going for, for rental. So that might be one that you could live in for a while. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that, that, I guess just to be clear, your goal would be to live in, in that one, then rent out the other three. Exactly. Yeah. And and so if you didn't do those cabinets right away, you could probably get in for a total of three thousand. If you did, then it might be what fifty five hundred, six thousand, something like that. Yeah, I would say six thousand. And then there's some there's some other minor issues. You know, basically there's wallpaper in the bathrooms that's peeling off that probably should be removed and painted. So a few, a few minor things, but overall the building's in great condition. Uh, no one's been living in it for a long time, but the utilities are still connected. So the, the plumbing and electrical work, um, they, they actually, the owner hires someone to regularly go clean it. Uh, so it's overall, it's really kept up. It's a really nice historic building, um, has some really cool old tile floors. Okay. So, okay. So we'll we'll get back to that in just a minute. But uh, what is it? What are they asking for the property? They are currently asking three fifty two. Okay. Have they had and offers? Yeah, they 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 accepted an offer for three hundred at one point. Mm -hmm. Um. So the it ended up falling through because. Generally, the common practice here is to put down anywhere from one one to five thousand as a as an earnest payment. Mm -hmm. And the owner, from what I understand, the owner didn't want to go through with it because the people weren't willing to put down the the entire amount that they would need to put down to have it um, to have it financed. So mm -hmm. his concern was that they would get to closing and and the money wouldn't be there. Okay. So he wanted to make sure that, that they had the money for that. So. I see. Okay. And any, do you know anything else about the seller? Like, is he like age or his, his situation? Is he, what his reason is for selling or any of that? Yeah. So the impression that I got is that he's an older guy. Um, I believe he grew up in the building mm -hmm. and he uh, basically, it seems like he's fairly financially well off. Um, has been holding on to the property, even though he's not making anything on it. Um, mm -hmm. But his kids are pressuring him to sell it, I guess. Okay. I see. Um, okay. So if you, if you were to say right now, your ideal uh, 
what, like if you were to offer, do you think you'd be close around the 300,000? Have you done any analysis that way? And we haven't talked about what the potential rent could be yet, but maybe you can share where you're at on that. Sure. Um, so this one, this one is a little bit, if you, if you analyze it from an income property perspective, it, the margins aren't quite there. If you analyze it from a single family, you know, just based on what you, what it would go for as a single family residence, it's very, very low. Mm -hmm. So um, I've kind of been looking at it from those two angles, kind of a mix of those two angles, since it's a property I want to live in, but I also want to make some cash flow out of it. Yeah. So I that area. I think that's a good point to, uh, that you bring up that um, income property is, is calculated one way, obviously, whereas property that we want to live in and, and, and raise a family in or do whatever is, is, is calculated not, not on income approach hard, most of the time. And so um, what you stated makes a lot of sense that it's a residential home and a residential neighborhood and it just happens to have a couple of other units with it. Um, so the home itself as a value as a home probably is, is well within reason, if I understand. But if it's calculated just from an income approach, then it, it, it may be a little bit high. Is that what I'm hearing? Yep, exactly. Okay. Yeah, so, so single family homes of that size in that neighborhood generally go for, I'd say very, very minimum 400,000. Okay, okay, interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, any idea with an appraisal what it might appraise at? And I know that's sort of a shot in the dark, but. Yeah, I don't know that I would really be that comfortable making a guess on that one. Mm -hmm. um, Based yeah, on location, they probably would, would uh, do you think they'd appraise it as a residential home based on location? I believe they would, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Especially from what I know, the, the two units are not separate on the deed, which I, mm -hmm. I think would be a good question for them. Mm -hmm. um, okay. What, do, what are you expecting that the, the rents would be, including the one that you would plan on living in? Because the way I would look at it is, assuming you're not living there, what would that property cash flow? Yeah, so the downstairs main unit, um, the, the realtor that, that has the listing agent, he was guessing 900 to a thousand. I think mm -hmm. he's a bit low from what I've seen in the neighborhood, Okay. but it might, it'd be a good conservative number to work with anyway. Yeah. That's on a long-term basis. Okay. Um, on the second floor, I believe probably around a thousand or 1100. Okay. And then the, the back unit, 300. Okay. And the downstairs back unit, that one I, I think as it is right now, couldn't be, would be difficult to rent out. Um, do you want to take into account what it might rent out for if the garage were added, or are you thinking it's better well, to let's, analyze let, it? Let's keep it at what it might be with the $3,000 that you said it potentially could get leased up with. Okay. So then so that one, one would not be rented out or would it be? Um, with the $3,000. Yeah. You had said 6,000 with cabinets or we had said 6,000 with kitchen cabinets upstairs uh, yep. and 3,000 otherwise. Yeah. So with that 3,000 part of that, I think it was, did I say 1,500 or mm. I think I said 2,000 or something like that for the downstairs. Yeah. Um, 2,000. And then you said something else for another uh, cabinet or something. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. So 2,500, I think, would be the downstairs. And that would make that rentable for okay. another 300. Okay. Gotcha. So if we say 26, 28, um, 2,800 a month, what are you using? If when you do your analysis, what, what, what are yeah. you paying as gross income? Um, 2,800 sounds right. Yeah. Let's see if I... Okay. And 
do you know, you had done some research on Airbnb and, and the way I look at that is that's sort of a bonus. So when, when we're evaluating this, I think we evaluate it as though it's not an Airbnb and as though you're not living in it because that's, that's how a new buyer would come in and, and evaluate it. So you don't want to pay more for it because it's an Airbnb unless that's your specific strategy where you decide specifically it's okay to buy it for more. Uh, but I think it's important to make sure that you're comparing what the true value is based on what an appraisal might, might bring it in at. So um, do you know roughly what, what you might expect for Airbnb? Is that like, can you get twice the amount or, and, and on this would just be just a, a wild guess based on what, what you've done for research is fine. Mm, I would say probably, say 130 a night mm -hmm. and figuring 18 nights per month mm -hmm. times two apartments plus um, so that's 4680 and then I would say I could get maybe another 35 per night for the for the back back mm -hmm. two units, thirty five each. Yeah. So thirty five times eighteen. And eighteen is a number that you had found based on. I think you have a friend that does some of this Airbnb. Yeah, she does. She rents houses um, on Airbnb, and she said generally her occupancy average is eighteen to twenty nights per month. Okay. So eight times 35 630 times 2 is 1260 plus the original 4680 so it'd be 5940 gross is, yep is my Airbnb gross rent. okay so so 5940 versus about 2800 mm -hmm. but in that there's going to be with the Airbnb, there's there's air conditioning, which I'm assuming is going to be expensive because Airbnb uh, renters probably aren't that conscious about closing the windows or turning the air conditioning off. Yeah, and um, and then also the, the the taking care of the the people coming in coming and going. So, but bottom line is you probably could do better financially if you did Airbnb than if you just did regular rental. Is that correct? Yep. Okay. Um, and then you've got the, the daily maintenance things that go on. So with the rents that you had stated before, the long-term rents, they are paying their own utilities, right? Uh, yep. Yep. That okay. one, the, 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 I guess there's a slight snag on that one that there's only two electric meters for the property. Okay. So, so I'm not sure an that adjustment, an adjustment made on, uh, somehow with the, with the, the rent or the, yep. Air, the okay with the electric okay all right so um so when you do the numbers based on income what number do you come up with with let's say an eight or a ten percent cap mm -hmm. and cap is just net operating income divided by um uh, sale price or divided by the value of the property Let's see. I don't have the. I don't have an analyzer done for this one. Okay. Well, um, if you have rough numbers, that's fine too. At this point, what we're doing while Brandon's figuring this out is what we're doing is we're just trying to get a a, a high level view of the potential of the property because when looking at properties like this one can get really caught up in the weeds on doing a lot of numbers and a lot of um, crunching and then something one some bigger item might just throw it out and then so there's been a lot of time spent on figuring it out so the way i like to do it is look at the high level numbers first get close and then if there's nothing that jumps out that is that automatically blows it out of the water then go into the numbers deeper. Obviously we want to go in really deep on numbers before the pro property is purchased, 
but by doing it in, in stages, it saves us from having to do a ton of evaluation just to have it be knocked out by something that we could have probably seen early on. Um, so in this case, uh, uh, we're just looking at it just to get a, a rough idea from an income approach, although this property would more likely be sold from a, a single family residence, a residence uh, approach. So um, you finding anything there, Brendan? Yeah, so if I do it from the, from the income approach, what I did is 2,800 gross rental income. And correct me as I'm going through some of these numbers because some of them I'm not very familiar with. I put, I put a 10% vacancy. Does mm -hmm. that sound right to you? Uh, yeah, I think it uh, depends on the market. 5% is a real common number in the state um, or has been, uh, generally speaking. So okay. I think 5% could be used. It's a little different in a property like this because um, it could be one of the small units that's, uh, that's vacant or it could be one of the big units or, or mm -hmm. it could be filled. And so, but just as a general rule of thumb with rental properties, it, it's been 5% uh, okay. been that, that has been very commonly used. I also fig am figuring in $500 for property management fees monthly, which is pretty high. Mm -hmm. um, that's what, that's what one of the companies that I am familiar with mm -hmm. charges per door. Mm -hmm. They charge 125 or 12%, whichever is greater. Um, so I put 500 as sort of the worst case property management fees per month. Repairs and maintenance, I estimated at 300. Mm -hmm. Does that sound like a decent estimate? For all four units or? or? For all four mm -hmm. units. Yeah, I think if, if, if there isn't a lot of deferred maintenance on it, it would seem like that should be reasonable. It might be okay. a little higher if it's Airbnb, but you have higher income. Sure. And then how about replacement reserve? I put $200. Yeah, that, yeah, that, that's, I think that's reasonable. Yeah. Okay. And I estimated $400 per month for real estate taxes and rental property insurance. Mm -hmm. well, I think I've got that at 200 for the, for the month, but I believe it's 200 for the year. Okay. That sound right. Yeah. Okay. So, so while you're doing those numbers, I just want to add that uh, one thing that I look at, like when you're doing this, Brandon, I would say that if you can figure it, the, the property management is one of those things when you figure it out uh, from an income approach. Uh, if this was truly figured as a rental property, then definitely that would be built in. But because this is a residential property, potentially, mm -hmm. then I would do a, a second calculation where uh, I, I always like doing a high, a lot of times I'll do a high, medium and low when I do the numbers. In this case, I would do like a, a high and a low, meaning that if, if you live in the property, um, mm -hmm. probably would would take care of the property management yourself. And you'd probably be able to do some of the, the minor maintenance things yourself. So you don't mm -hmm. necessarily need to charge for it, but you don't want to be caught short with cash either. So that would make the numbers look better for you if you're doing some of that work yourself. But if mm -hmm. you're hiring it out, then, then that's another set of numbers. And so uh, yep. looking at it from both perspectives, you, you kind of want to find the outside edge of both methods and then make your decision. Uh, as we know, residential properties where we live are a lot more emotional uh, purchases um, than an income property that is purchased just for rental income and uh, just for, for investment purposes. So uh, that, that's something that would be taken into account. But, but by, by looking at the envelope all the way from, from what it potentially could be if you hired everything out kind of worst case scenario to where you did a lot of the work and best case scenario, you're going to be able to get a, a, a feel in between there where, where you, where you feel like you should land. So yeah, sounds good. So uh, what, what number did you come up with? So monthly operating expenses is 1417. Mm -hmm. I've got total annual operating income of 31,920. 
total annual operating expense of seventeen thousand four. Mm -hmm. For an annual net operating income of fourteen thousand nine hundred and sixteen. Mm -hmm. So if we look at it from a twelve percent cap rate, it'd be the property valuation would be one hundred and twenty four thousand three hundred. Yeah. And that's with the high expenses. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if you did it, let's say you did it at an eight and eight cap rate. And that cap rate is really just uh, what if somebody was putting in money into this all cash into this investment, what would they get on an annualized return based on the cash flow that it's kicking off? So what Brandon just shared was 24%, uh, 12% uh, cash return annualized to uh, on the investment, but if if the investor was getting eight percent return if all cash was put in to, to purchase it, what would that come to? One eighty six four fifty. Okay, one eighty six four fifty. One other rule of thumb that that is used sometimes, which is again a very rough rule of thumb, would be the one percent rule. So um, if the rents in this case we said were probably around twenty eight. 2800 2900 then using that rule of thumb it could be up into the two uh, 280 290 thousand dollar valuation so again this is an odd duck because it is it's really a residential home with some additional units that can be rented out or it could be considered a duplex with a couple of uh, um, sort of cobbled in uh, uh, small rental units um, so all we're doing is we're, again, we're kind of stretching to, to, to the outside bounds all the way around and then sort of making a decision from there what the next step would be. Um, what am I missing here? Anything, Brandon? Uh, nope, not that I can think of. So I think what, what we wanted to do here now was talk a little bit about the potential of financing. So... The challenge, I think, will be that it may be a hard one to get financed through FHA or what, what have you checked in on, on that, Brandon? FHA or conventional or any, any research you've done on that? Um, so FHA, it would work for, for FHA or conventional. Mm -hmm. FHA will do up to four units. Okay. So, um, and even this one, it would be only considered two units because there's only two electric meters. Okay. Uh, the cap in San Juan is 417,000, I believe. Okay. So it falls within those guidelines. Okay. 417,000 purchase price or yeah. loan, loan or mm -hmm. property value. Um, one thing that they, that they, I'm sure would require is cash flow to be able to show consistent cash flow, and you said that this property has been vacant. Um, yeah. So one of the challenges could be getting it to qualify from a cash flow perspective because I believe that you said your income is not high enough to be able to qualify without their showing, without it showing some sort of rental income, correct? Yep. Yeah. And so this is where uh, we talked about, well, what, what, what could we possibly look at from maybe getting the owner to possibly participate somehow, either in uh, subordinate seller carryback or, or a lease option or something like that. Um, subordinate seller carryback, just very briefly, is uh, let's say that the owner, an owner of a property sells, sells a property for a uh, hundred thousand dollars and somebody gets bank financing for eighty thousand dollars and they only have ten thousand dollars down the buyer the buyer would put ten thousand dollars down the new financing would come in as a first position and then the property owner would stay in either as an equity owner for the other ten percent remaining or do a secondary uh, like a second position note which that would then be termed a uh, subordinate seller financing situation. So it's like having a second, second loan position against the property. But the advantage to the seller can be, if they're comfortable with the buyer and they know, know the buyer will perform, the advantage can be that sometimes they can get a higher price for the property. Um, they can get maintenance. In this case, there's a potential that 
that maybe the guy, maybe the owner is tired of maintaining the property, tired of getting, having somebody else to do it. So if, if Brandon is able to show a seller of a property that, that he has a good history, a good track record, good um, references, has the ability to do the, the maintenance, has, has done construction, all of those things are values that could potentially be brought to the, to the table. And so I think what, what the next step I would look at doing is trying to find out what the seller's position really is. From what I heard you say, Brandon, the seller is older. He is maintaining the property without any income. His family members are, I think you said, are kind of pressuring him, if you understand, if you, if you or is that what, what you were told? Yeah, that's the feeling I got from it. Okay, and, and I think, and you said there's a an agent on this, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and and you are a, a broker as well, a broker agent. Yep, that is correct. So, so the thing that that so we've got a few things that we could potentially work with. One is um, the possibility that it could maybe be a lease option, because if this seller. Uh, if you can get to the point where you can get him to really feel comfortable with you and the, the fact that you're going to perform and, and kind of prove to him different ways that you will perform and he will be a better, better off by selling it to you, then uh, possibly a lease option where you uh, lease the property from him could be a master lease where you lease the entire property and then you could sublease and get some income from the other properties while you're doing it and doing that for 12 months or 18 months because then you can get it rented up and then you'll be able to show you'll be able to prove the cash flow the stabilized income that that FHA or bank would require so it allows you to work uh, work that for a period of 12 to 18 months what I, I've done this in the past where I would set it up with a 12 month option and then the a, a second option that could go another 12 months if all the terms of the first period have been followed and, and the relationship has been working well so you may may be able to get some sort of an option with this seller um, to be able to do it that way so either a lease option possibly a contract sale where where you you put a small amount down and uh, maybe it balloons in two years, um, and uh, maybe you. Some ways you can prove to him that you're going to do what you say you're going to do is you can set it up so that all the rents go to his bank account, um, so that he knows that you're not going to just walk away with rental payments. Um, you can get good references for him. You can um, share share different things like that. You could even bring in someone who would do a personal guarantee or. You know, there, there are different ways of, of making him, that, that seller, feel comfortable with you. So in this case, we have another real estate agent involved, which as I see it from my experience, it, the next step would be to talk with that agent and get him on board uh, with the, the whole idea, the whole concept of getting the seller to agree to a sale by lease option or, or some creative financing. One last thing, if, as a proper, if, the, if the property owner uh, does something like this where they do the owner financing or the lease option, a lot of times when I did this, I, I've done it a lot in the past where I would be able to get eight, 10, 12% higher purchase price from the buyer than normal because of that creative financing. So I would be able to get a higher, a higher sale price on the property. So you may be able to offer a little bit higher value on that property um, just because you're getting, you're giving, because he's giving you good financing. They say it's, it's either financing or price. It's a trade-off. So either you get a really good price with no financing or if there is financing, you pay a little bit more. So, uh, so I think maybe, um, and uh, any, anything you want to share, Brandon? Mm, no, I can't think of anything at this point. Okay. So what, what Brandon did is he had given me, we're going to try this and see, see if we can give the agent a call 
and uh, I've not spoken with the agent at all. Brandon, you've spoken with him a couple of times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What can you, anything you can share about him, anything that you know? Um, not off the top of, nothing, nothing that I can think of. He contacted me actually trying to contact another agent and told me about this property. And so I said, oh, well, I live down the street, so I'll take a look at it. Okay. Um, so he was kind of reaching out to different people that he knew of to, okay. um, to try to find out, find a buyer basically. Okay. And so on this call, I think our goal is to just see what, what his take is, see if he has any additional information that we can talk uh, that might be able to be part of the puzzle of putting something together that works for everybody. One disadvantage for him could be his, if he, if he perceives that he may be squeezed out of the deal because he doesn't get a commission because it's a, an option or something like that. So if, if it gets to that point that we're, we're, I mean, somehow you'd want to make sure that he is protected and that he gets a commission, whether it's either up front or, or, or maybe delayed um, from the perspective of an agent. If, if the property has been on the market for a long time and it hasn't sold, then a delayed payment on a sale is sometimes better than no payment and losing the listing. So we'll be able to get a little bit of a feel for that, I think, as we have this discussion. So I don't know, I have no idea how this is gonna go, but we're gonna give it a try. <laughs> well, uh, his name is Jose, you said? Yep. And he knows that you're gonna be calling and that, how did you position it with me? Um, I just said that you're my dad and that you've been doing this longer than I have. And so I was, hoping we could do a conference call. So, um, so we okay. could just discuss possibilities a little bit more. Okay. All right. So, uh, and he speaks English, you said. Yep. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, here goes. Let me know if you can't hear it. Okay. Hopefully he knows it's a 320 area code calling. Yeah, I did mention. Hi, Jose. Hi, Brandon, how are you? Uh, actually, this is, this is Tom, and uh, this is Brandon's dad. And um, Hi, Tom, how are you? Good, good. Yep. Uh, certainly, yep. If you uh, do a uh, couple minutes, you think? Okay. All right. We'll uh, we will give you a try back. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks. Yep. So we may just uh, we may uh, we'll talk here a little bit, but then if we need to, we can just do a a pause and then we can jump back on when he does call. Sure. Sounds good. I didn't quite catch all of what he said. He had a customer. I don't know if he has a uh, if he does something other than real estate agent, but. He said he had a customer with him uh, okay. and that it would could take about 20 minutes. Okay. And uh, what do you know about the agent? Very little. Um, he, uh, yeah, very, I don't know a whole lot about him. Okay. Well, maybe um, I think what we'll do is we'll, We'll plan on pausing it right here, and then we'll jump back on as soon as it's ready, so. Sounds good. So we're gonna take just a couple minutes here to go through some of the pictures of the property while we wait for the real estate agent to call us back. Um, Brennan, do you just wanna walk through these and just give a little, little bit of information through it, what your first thoughts were when you saw it, what you see as uh, potential issues or what you like about it or what what improvements you might see just kind of your assessment as you were going through it yeah sounds good um so this is the exterior of the house from the front uh from the street view mm -hmm. another angle from from the same side but but more to the right it's got a pretty big tree in the front mm -hmm. um, <laughs> there's the the gardener's toilet that you know, back in the day when help wasn't allowed to be in the house. Ah, interesting. Yeah, <laughs> that looks like a small space. Uh -huh. Yeah. 
So there's, there's the garage. It's covered with, I think that might be fiberglass. So it's got a really nice long covered garage space. It does mm -hmm. make the interior of the first floor bedrooms look a little bit dark, but mm -hmm. the, the agent Jose seemed to think it was a bigger deal than I thought it was. I, I didn't really mind it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that carport, um, what would be a resolution there? Either, either taking it down or not just not having an issue with the fact that it keeps the bedrooms a little darker. Yeah. For me personally, I would just keep it as is. I didn't think it was bad at all, especially when it's, when it's hot out here being kind of dark is not necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, yeah, I didn't see any issue with it at all. Okay. Um, and then in the back kind of where the picture is being taken from right now, yeah. there's this garage space, the garage door was closed. So I stuck the camera through the garage door window, mm -hmm. but this space right now is closed with the garage door and it's right next to the really small borderline studio that I had mentioned earlier, which is this one. And that's what, that's where it could possibly be expanded. Exactly. Yeah. So the wall on the right here mm -hmm. if you broke a doorway in there. Um, it could open up into this garage. Oh, and nice. Okay. Where that garage door is could just be made into a wall. Mm -hmm. um, this bathroom is really weird. I'm not sure why they made it like that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so something, I mean, people for those small studios, people are generally not picky with how, mm -hmm. how they look. Mm -hmm. Um, it's got that really skinny door right there goes into that bathroom too. <laughs> yeah. So for FHA, that may not qualify as a rental unit. So maybe that, that would be one of the two or $300 a month rents possibly. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Neither of these smaller units will technically qualify as FHA because they don't have their own electric meters. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Um, and then I think I had mentioned earlier, just some exterior painting, some minor stuff. Here's basically where you can see it, that it's mm -hmm. looks like they took down a downspout or something. And there was an air conditioning unit there that could be repainted. Nothing urgent. Mm -hmm. It's got a nice mango tree right next to it. Mm -hmm. um, so here's the rear view. It's got this interior courtyard, which is really nice because it blocks a lot of sound and has a lot of privacy. Sure. Um, so both the upstairs and downstairs unit have a back laundry area that comes out from the back kitchen. That's really nice. Um, right. there's the inside view from the first floor laundry area and that door to the left goes to the kitchen. Mm -hmm. Got the cool old glass pantry shelves. Here's the kitchen viewing into the bathroom. This is in the downstairs unit that has two bathrooms. The other bathroom is, uh, I think it's a, uh, it just goes into one bedroom. Mm -hmm. So that's an issue that neither of the bathrooms really go into the common space except through the kitchen. I see. Um, these cabinets sort of vintagey, they could make do until finances got in a place where they could be replaced. But they likely would qualify for FHA. Yeah, they would pass. I'm, I'm sure they would pass just fine. FHA is very, lenient on what they qualify for cabinets. Mm -hmm. um, they just need something there, basically a small counter counter area and a sink. Okay. And most, most houses are sold without appliances here. Mm -hmm. um, so the bathrooms are in good condition, but outdated. And I think all the bathrooms had wallpaper that was peeling. So that was something I was going to put in my list of, of possible repairs that I could do or you to could add. Get and the idea there being that you, while you're there, you could increase the value of the property for the person, for the seller that is giving the lease option. And therefore, uh, um, you know, by increasing the value, it's making, it's giving them an incentive to go along with what you're, you're proposing. Yep, exactly. So the, there's the doorway into one of the bedrooms. They've got mm -hmm. these old wooden closets, which I thought were kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Um, the house in general just has a lot of sort of vintage charm. It's definitely not modern, but um, I kind of enjoy that. Mm -hmm. How about the windows? Any any assessment? Any anything specific on the assessment of the windows? Uh, those sorts of windows are very common in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. um, so at this point, I would just leave those as is. Mm -hmm. 
that's the that window goes into the covered carport uh, um so it you know you, you kind of get a feel there for what the lighting is yeah um so it's not terrible and like those louvers that are multicolored. i mean that as simple as what uh just giving it a paint new new clean up paint paint where color. is that like the window louvers Oh, okay. No, those are white. That's actually just uh, the, since they're open, it's looking into the, into the carport. Oh, so I think that's oh. a, <laughs> I ah. think that's a surfboard on the wall. Oh, sure. That, yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. Um, some of the pictures are pretty blurry here. You don't see a uh, uh, suspended ceiling very much at all in Puerto Rico. I've, I've never seen it in Puerto Rico. I don't No. Know. So this bathroom is, office, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this bathroom, um, has the acoustic ceiling because I think this one, this one is the one that was added mm. where they made a closet into the bathroom. I see. Um, so I'm guessing the plumbing is coming through the ceiling. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. So yeah, everything's in great shape. All the plumbing is working from what I understand. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just outdated. Yeah. yeah. Which well, good. Well, that kind of gives us an idea of what the, what the property looks like. Um, yeah. So this one, they had a wood closet that was put in. The realtor was making kind of a big deal of the fact that they covered up one of the windows to the front yard. But mm -hmm. I, again, I didn't think it was a big issue. Mm -hmm. um, I thought this closet is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. um, here and, you can, and the furniture you mentioned that, that you, you might ask about keeping that. One of the things about furniture like that is if they do end up selling it, they, it, it, it's a hassle to go out and sell furniture. So mm -hmm. possibly yeah. maybe willing to throw it in if that's something you wanted to want. Yeah. To. Yeah. I, I thought there was some really cool antique stuff in there. Um, it also, I didn't, you know, obviously didn't go through it, but in one of the bedrooms, you'll see that there were a bunch of uh, old like antique artwork and stuff like that. So, okay. I mean, anything that he would be willing to include would be kind of cool. Mm hmm. Okay, um, good. So here I took a picture. It's got the two meters. Mm -hmm. uh, here's a view from the upstairs. There's sort of a stairway that goes to the second unit. I'll see if I can go back to it. This goes from the laundry unit of the main unit in the second floor mm -hmm. down into um, the side unit. But there's on the other side of the laundry area, there's a stairway coming up from the courtyard. So whoever lives here, would have to kind of do a little bit of a maze to get there, but there is access from the outside without coming through the front of the house. Okay, good. So I'll skip backwards to, um, that's that. That's the view from that little stairway. Yeah, okay. So it's basically just a simple small room, bathroom, mm -hmm. and right there where there's no tile, he said there originally was a small kitchen cabinet there. I see. Um, so here's the kitchen that doesn't have any um, cabinets mm -hmm. in the old refrigerator. I'm not sure if that works. Mm -hmm. So, and we had talked about potentially doing Airbnb. These are all, you know, appliances and furniture is something that would have to be taken into consideration as well. Yeah. Um, but Good. nice bathroom the, or nice kitchen. The kitchen has the opportunity to break that wall open to give it some access to the, uh, to the living, living room area. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can go back. Okay. There's the bathroom. Mm -hmm. Again, really good condition, but a little bit ugly. Mm -hmm. um, there's oh. the one of the, uh, that's the only spot where I noticed some filtration in from mm -hmm. the roof. Yeah. Gotcha. That needs to be resolved. Yeah. Nice balconies. Uh, here's the, one of the bedrooms that has, the bedrooms are huge, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. um, they could potentially, I think, be divided into, you know, two, one of the bedrooms could be divided into two if that added some sort of value. Mm -hmm. um, and there's the living room. Right. And that is it. Good. Well, that gives a good idea of what the house is like, I think, with some cleanup and um, a little bit of elbow grease. It looks like it could be a a nice house so we'll yeah we'll see what uh, what our agent has to say on it so catch up in when he calls all right sounds good 
We are now ready to give Jose a call, the real estate agent. So here we go. Give me a thumbs up if you hear it, all right? Okay. Hi, Jose. Hi, Tom. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Oh, nice. Yeah. Well, cool. Uh, so you have just a couple of minutes to talk a little bit about the property? Okay. And I have Brandon here as well. Can you, Brandon, can you hear Jose all right? Yeah, I can hear pretty good. Hi, Jose. How are you? Good. So, um, yeah, what we wanted to do is talk a little bit about um, maybe if you could give just a bit of a background on uh, if, if there's anything you could share about the seller, what his goal is. One of the things, well, and I, let, 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 me, let, me, let me explain you how it works. This, this seller inherited this home. Matter of fact, he grew and lived all his life in this home. Inherited, he definitely inherited uh, so he doesn't owe a penny in the house, and uh, right now he, he has a, he has a, he's using it for a, as a warehouse. And he just have a few minor things in there. Uh, every, all the, the house has always been connected to the water and to electricity, so it's running. They, they matter of fact, they sent a, a, a woman to clean the house every two weeks. Mm -hmm. and, fair condition, I will say. I mean, it's an old house in the, from the 1950s, but it's still pretty good condition. And, uh, and this person uh, is, I mean, financially, it's well, well established. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, Brendan had uh, uh, asked me about this property because I had done some different forms of creative financing in the past. And um, what I, I had asked him a couple of questions and he didn't know the answers to uh, specifically what, what uh, and you just answered some of those questions. But one, one thing, one thought that came up was the idea by, but with Brandon, with his financing possibilities, he would really like to be able to do it by way of FHA financing. The challenge with FHA financing, he qualifies for just fine, um, but the challenge is that they need a certain amount of time that the property is seasoned or rented out. And so, uh, um, right now, so that the second floor does not have a kitchen. I mean, it has a space, but not a cabinet. Yeah. And I think that they might give you, but it, 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 wait, I have to find out. This, I mean, they can give you a, a two, a two or three K FHA loan for, uh, in order to repair, I mean, to, to make the kitchen. Okay? Yeah. And, well, yeah, I, I definitely understand that. I'm wondering, I guess, and I'm just going to run something by you and see if you think it has any possibility. And um, I know that you've worked on it a long time and it's been a, a, a lot of effort that you put into it. So 
uh, certainly would make sure that you were kept in the loop all the way through. But what I had done on a, on a couple other properties a few years ago where it was a similar situation was to uh, go in, get, get a lease option to, to um, an agreement basically to buy the property at a set price and go in with that lease option where I, I would go in and do uh, some of the, any of the work that needed to be done. Like for instance, in this case, putting cabinets in and, um, and then there were a couple other minor items, get, doing some work to improve the property and then get it leased up so that then it shows the, the uh, it has a track record, the history that's required for FHA and then uh, after that, after that 12 months or 10 months, whatever time that takes to get to that, that seasoning, because all, because both units would be rented out, then, um, then the sale would, would take place. And, uh, and that way the owner can get close to what they want. They, they manage it this way. I, I'm not concerned about that. In my only concern is that it's Yeah. So uh, that could be one. I mean, I'm 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 in the best effort to help both sides. Yep. Uh, that's my job. And uh, what I want to do here, or what I suggest to do here, is uh, give. I mean, if if you're serious, give, give him a, a, a send them an offer. One idea and keep a second one as a second option in case he retracted or he changed his mind. Yeah. I mean, sure. Okay. And that's, I mean, that's the easiest way or the best way to deal with these matters. I mean, be open. And yeah. First of all, I will, I will suggest uh, try to, I don't know, if, if, I mean, do you work in, in financing? Uh, yes, ac yeah. Actually, uh, we have a real estate fund that we that we manage. The problem with the the challenge with this one is it doesn't qualify for what we finance for real estate with well, with a fund. Well, anyhow, uh, I will uh, contact also a few local managers and ask them to give me an idea of what kind of financing will be applicable to this. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't care about it. I mean, I just go and show him the, the figures and the numbers and whatever it is. Yeah. I try to, to push it back and forth until we get an answer either good or not good. <laughs> okay. okay. Great. So, yeah, and I think that there are ways, uh, for instance, I think, I think Brandon could get a, a letter from the bank that states that he has been pre-qualified for FHA financing for X amount. And if the property is, has a, has a, the cash flow for X amount of months, then, uh, then, then he qualifies or it's pre, uh, yeah, pre, pre qualification letter. And that could maybe, uh, and, and the other thing is that if Brandon were to do that where he was living in one unit and, um, and either paying, paying rent for that unit or did a master lease or something like that, where, where the owner of the property doesn't have to, maintain it anymore, pay for maintenance, and, and we can put in some sort of provisions where there's minimum standards so that, so that maybe you as a third party can, can keep, eye, keep an eye on everything to make sure it's all being uh, handled the way the agreement says. And I think there are ways to structure it. Okay. Writing a contract 
one for lease and one for the uh, purchase option, and get one instructed to the other one, and that way we could work it out. Sure. So uh, it, 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 let me, okay, so. So, yeah, what we can do, we can put together sort of a bullet point, uh, uh, sort of a high, higher level bullet point email that will give you an idea. And then, and then uh, you and Brandon, and I'll be there to help out any way I can, but then you can decide what sort of paperwork, how you want to present it to the, okay. to the homeowner. Okay. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, Brandon, did you have any other questions? Yeah, Jose, I just had a, a couple other um, smaller items that I was curious on. Um, do you know what that property pays for property taxes? Uh, so one question Brandon had is, do you know what the property taxes are on it? Okay. 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 Good. Good. And then, what other question, Brandon? Yeah, maybe I'll just write out my questions in the email and send it to him. Okay. That will be much, much better. Yeah. Okay. But even though I'm sure it, it won't go, uh, I mean, uh, it, it will be close between 1500 to 1400000 a year. Uh, uh, and, and, and as soon as, for example, if Brian buys the house, this house, at the moment he, he, he buys the house, he asks for a, a, a exemption that they will grant it within a year after he, he lived the first year and he will get uh, a deduction from the tax uh, uh, the property tax for 15 years he, he will be paying like half of what, what he's usually paying okay yeah that's great i know we talked a little bit about that but that's great okay so a possible 50 percent exemption for up to 15 years yeah okay excellent um, good. Well, I think that that pretty much answers the questions here and we will get, uh, Brandon will get you an email with a few other questions possibly and then a high level uh, bullet point um, email to you as well. No problem. I'm, I'm the best uh, position to help you. All right. That sounds good. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Jose. Thanks a lot, Jose. With you. Yep. You too. Bye, take Brandon. care. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Cool. So that was optimistic news, right? Yeah. What were your thoughts? Um, I really like the idea. Number one, I like the idea that he is a, he's open-minded and he's a problem solver. He has a problem solver attitude towards it. Mm -hmm. um, That's the impression I got too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sometimes agents can be um, more, more black and white where they just, they, they don't care to go to that point of, of um, seeing if there are other creative ways of doing it, but that's really good that Jose is in that position here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I think by getting the FHA approval, pre-approval letter, um, you know, all I would do here is I would, I would try and identify every possible objection that he would have and then figure out a way that if you were in his shoes, how would you make yourself feel comfortable that it's a good deal? So, I mean, things that can happen for him, he could get somebody in there that'll beat up the property. He could get somebody in there that won't make the payments on the property. He could get somebody in there that would um, have parties at the property, whatever. Um, Let's see, he could not perform in, uh, he could get somebody that just doesn't perform in the end. Um, somebody that takes the rent, but doesn't, doesn't, he doesn't get his payments. So I think every one of those can be mitigated 
by either having escrows or letters of approval or restrictions on the type of renters or uh, all those things. I think they can, they can all be uh, isolated so that they are, so each of those risks are mitigated, I believe. Sure. So, no, I thought it was, I thought it was good. Um, he had, he said he had a couple offers at 250 from what I understood. And he has a, currently has an offer. No, he had an offer for 300,000 that he accepted, but then he rejected it because the person worked for the government and there was nervousness about whether the government, whether he'd be able to make payments. Is that what you understood? Oh, okay. That's the part where I couldn't hear what he was saying. I heard something about Puerto Rico government. Yeah. So I think that that's where, where he was a little bit apprehensive. So, um, and, and I think with, you know, knowing that, that you've got the potential backing of, uh, of, of, like the company that that does real estate investing i think mm -hmm. even though we wouldn't do this property because it's owner occupied um it still has some value in knowing that there's the experience behind the group that does the fund management so i think that that sure could possibly mm -hmm. um but yeah so i think next step uh if you want to maybe put together a list of items that you think of and mm -hmm. then we can maybe on another call we can do a um, we can show the progress on this property as things go but for now I think it kind of gives an idea of what how we take a look at things and uh, what options there might be sure sounds good anything you would uh, like to say before wrapping this up on this call um you know, one, one just quick thought that I, I had uh, that popped into my mind was related to what we had mentioned about the real estate commission aspect. At what point would you find that to be a, a good thing to bring up or would you put that within the, the offer? I would put it in the offer right away. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I would put it in in a way where, it's, where it doesn't come across as, as a take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. just like the bar just like the seller of the property th they have certain reasons why they may or may not do certain things mm -hmm. agent i would say would be the same way that they have if 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 you present something to him as what you think might be fair and workable if it doesn't work for him the way it's presented there might be another way to 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 adjust it so that it can be worked um so they're again being flexible, putting it out in a way where it's not demanding, it's not take it or leave it, it's, and it's fair. It's coming all of this. If you sit in the middle, if you're if you're in the middle, and you can point to both sides of the equation and say yes, that's fair. I I totally switch seats with that person, or mm -hmm. alternatively, I'd switch seats with that person. So it's identifying what you think from a very neutral perspective is fair. And then laying it out that way so that everybody comes out. That's, mm -hmm. that's how, how we get to deals that work out where everybody can, where collaboration is, is, is of high value. Um, deals get done. Um, people get along better. There's an alignment of interest. People are working together. Um, risks are lower. Yeah. Um, it just, that's, that's been my experience of what happens when you can come from that very neutral and transparent perspective where, mm -hmm. where you aim to, to get everybody covered, everybody's, every, everybody's goals or everybody's um, what they would like to have as an outcome, get as close to that for everybody as possible and then take it from there. And sometimes it, sometimes it just doesn't work, which may, just means it maybe just wasn't meant to be. Sure. So, but good. Well, thanks, Brandon, for being on the call and... Um, Definitely looking forward to working with you to get this, uh, see how far we can get this one to go. Yep, sounds good. Thanks for helping me out. You bet. Catch up a bit later. All right. All right. Bye. Bye.